My name is Christine Ruza. This is Lee Fryer Davis, and we welcome you to Teaching Coding Swiftly. To get us started, we'll just start with a couple of questions. What image comes to mind when you think of computer programs? First image. You can't insult us. What do you us. think of? Well, you got to go Keep looking. Okay. Lots of numbers. Lots of numbers. Probably stuck in a cubicle somewhere. Probably a guy with like sandals and socks on, right? That's that's your stereotypical computer programmer from the movies. Uh, have you co coded before? So yes, maybe, and and no. So wide spectrum of that. Um, are you carrying a mobile device, a phone, tablet, computer? Yeah, we all do, right? We all have these devices, and yet we don't really think of ourselves as a stereotypical uh, geek in a cubicle. How do we reconcile this? And as computer science teachers, we were looking at labs where we have kids sitting in front of desktops doing things that could have been done in the 80s. And yet these kids were carrying around devices that are much, much more powerful than that and not really realizing that they could do much with those devices that was their creation. At the same time, we were asking ourselves, what if our students could actually feel genuine excitement in the classroom? So think, grade 11, grade 12, students who are actually excited. You know, these are the same kids that don't even put their hand up anymore in some of their other classes. Could we get them excited? Could we give them real world skills, working with authentic tools that they're going to use when they leave high school, when they leave university? Um, could we build confidence in their ability to make a difference? These are the students who are going to be solving the world's problem. Poverty, right? World hunger. They're going to have those problems to face. Do we really wanting, want them just finding all the prime numbers between 1 and 100? Right? We want them doing something that makes them understand that they can make a difference and they can start making a difference now in high school. They don't have to wait till they're 30. And can they see their universe expand? And we found that the answer to all of those questions is yes, definitely. The first time you have a student who takes an app that they have developed and pushes it to the device that they carry around in their pocket or haul around with them in their backpack, even if it's a terrible app, even if all it does is say, hi there, you just see their universe expand. They look at it and they go, I, I coded that and, and now it's on my phone. If I can do that, I can do anything. And you just, you see this look come across their face and you just know their universe has exploded on them. Because now, if they can do that, just think of all the things that they can do and the responsibility that goes with being able to, because these are the students who are going to be solving all of this. So then the question becomes, well, how do you make all of that happen? The way it came up about for Lee and I is back in October, the board offered a math collaborative action research project, and they, they promoted it to the math heads. And so I was at that meeting, and so I popped up my hand and I said, how about computer science? We're kind of math. And they said, Kim Kina, who is a former computer science teacher who was introducing it, said, yeah, sounds good to me. And I said, yes, we're in. So I put out the call to the computer science teachers. Lee came on board along with a couple of other teachers. And by December, day before Christmas break, uh, Harry Neeson came into my classroom and said, we've got you some hardware. Five laptops for each school. Go. At that point, Lee and I looked at each other and said, do you know how to code in Swift? I don't know how to code in Swift. And neither one of us had a clue. So that meant that in January, we started meeting regularly. We started learning Swift. We got some <coughs> hardware. And a month later, we started with our classes. So we were often just an hour ahead or behind our classes in what they were learning. Uh, there was a lot of collaboration of, you want to do what? OK, let's try that together. Let's see if we can figure it out. By March, we were getting a little bit of professional development, which helped us get a little bit ahead of our kids. But they were, of course, already starting their projects. Um, by April, we were starting to share what we had experienced with the other computer science teachers in the board, because we realized we were onto something big. In June, I was 
I'm fortunate enough to be invited to attend the Worldwide Developers Conference in San Francisco, where I got my universe hugely expanded while the students back at home were completing their projects and pushing them to their devices. The kinds of projects that they came up with, um, college level student got an Apple Watch from his uncle, sort of a hand-me-down, decided he wanted to code for it. I'm like, oh, college level student coding to a device which I don't own, don't have access to, can't afford that right away. Uh, sure, why not? And he was able by the end of the semester to code a very simple app that gave him an inspirational quote every morning. So push a button, you get yourself your inspirational quote. Uh, video games, always a popular um, target. Group of four worked on tank warfare. They learned how to use cross-platform development. They were using the PC. They tied that with the Mac laptop and an iOS um, iPad in order to get this game working. Two college level students created a little simple platform game where you're a downhill skier and you have to avoid little obstacles. One of those students is now in college working as a computer programmer working towards getting his diploma. Solar System Simulator, one of my students uh, worked with a partner on how to simulate the birth of a planet in the solar system. So all sorts of mathematics that went on there. We ended up having to communicate with some university professors, dig out some textbooks from the 1960s, and it, the computer science was driving the math. He loved it so much, he came back this fall and said, hey, let's start a computer science club because I want to finish my app. So got to a point, he said, yeah, I've got sort of the first rendition of it. I think I could do a whole lot more. So. He came back, started a computer science club just so he could finish his app. In Lee's classes, they did some ray tracing. You can see a picture here of one of their screenshots, dealt with swarms, some handwriting recognition. Like These are high-powered apps that really involve a lot of mathematics and some really cool graphics by the time they're all finished. To do that, we used Swift. Swift is a modern open source programming language that Apple developed as a replacement for Objective-C. It's based on other C-based languages. Uh, typically, uh, students want to code in C or C++ because they say, my dad coded in that. He says it's the best language, and my dad knows everything, so I'm going to code in that. Um, so it's built on that, so it's a, a fairly easy transition for our grade 12 students. A little harder to sell in grade 11 because they don't know enough about it yet. But certainly by grade 12, they were ready to say, yeah, OK. What Apple did is they looked at the popular modern programming languages. And they said, how can we make it better? What's the next evolution? So they cleaned up the syntax, made it easier to learn, things like getting rid of the semicolons from C. And they made sure that it promoted good programming techniques. So you can't code in an unsafe way. It's very, very difficult. Where in C or C++, it's really easy to code things you just shouldn't code. Um, Swift prevents you. It forces you to code in a way that is safe and promotes good collaboration between you and your, uh, your fellow um, coders. Typically used to create apps for iOS devices, as well as Mac OS, Apple Watch, Apple TV. Um, but because it's open source, it is capable of being ported to other platforms. And there's been lots of rumors about Google taking its Android program into Swift. And so lots of opportunity down the road of potentially this working for any device that the kids have, not just um, iOS devices. To code with Swift, there's two options. The first option is the Playgrounds iOS app. So if you have an iPad, um, this is just an app that you would download, typically targeting about the middle school level. So you get this blobby creature that you're trying to get to move and collect gems in the right way. And so you learn some very rudimentary coding um, from that. You can also build your own code uh, using the Playgrounds app, but again, at a middle school level. So for high school kids, after about an hour, they've pretty much done that. They're ready for some real tools. So we focused our attention on Xcode. The Xcode IDE is free download for um, the iOS and Mac environment, but it's professional tools. Right? These are the tools that actual Apple developers are using on a daily basis. It includes a number of different features. There's a playground for rapid prototyping, which we'll demo in a few minutes. 
It has an editor, including an interface builder, to handle those graphical bits in a clean and easy way, once you understand how to use it. It has some visual control, so you're not having to type everything. Some of it is choosing things from menus and dragging and dropping. But you have the power to code by hand whenever you want. So you can mix and match the two. There is console output if needed for debugging, and it has an iOS simulator. So if you want to code an app for your grandma and you don't want her to know, you can um, pick that as a target, know what, whatever device she has. You can code it, test it on your Mac laptop, and then Christmas Eve, just download it to her device and look at that, grandma, what have you got on your iPad? Look at this. Um, and that's really, I think, one of the biggest things. The ability to take something you've done in class, download it to a device, and take it and say, look, grandma, look what I did. And grandma has a clue that, oh wow, that looks really neat. I can push the buttons, I can do whatever. They don't have to know a lot about coding to be able to appreciate and communicate with their grandkids about it. So lots of, of powerful, powerful things that we can do with it. What's next for us, now that we have had our grade 11, or grade 12s doing the coding together, coming up with apps, seeing the excitement on their faces, where do we go from there? We've got lots of ideas, far more ideas than we have time. We have started as of Friday reorganizing our grade 11 and 12 courses using the spiral learning that we're hearing so much about lately. Um, we also have as a resource the app development with Swift. It's an iBook that Apple uh, released in September. The students that I have that are coding in the Computer Science Club, I have four of them that were in grade 11, decided they wanted to create an app. They said, hey, we're in computer science next semester. Can we start early? I, of course, said yes. And uh, they wanted to meet not just once a week, but twice a week. They started with the iBook. So I didn't have to do a lot of teaching of that. They just worked their way through. And then we'll clean up the little odds and ends when they get to the actual course itself. So they're working through that in our coding club. Lee has been in communication with some elementary schools in order to create some meaningful apps. So you think of having grade six students as your client. You have your art class designing all the digital elements. And you have your computer science class doing the code that puts all of that together, right? Creating a meaningful app. And if you get a meaningful app that solves a real world problem, maybe putting it up on the app store for everyone to see. You have that ability. Um, we've also talked a lot about how you could perhaps use playgrounds as problem solving tools within the math classroom. Right? Instead of saying, okay, I want you to write down the next five um, rows in the table of values so that we can see the pattern, why not code it? Why not use technology to do that? We know that a lot of the modern proofs that are coming out of professional math are not just paper and pencil. They're not fingering the sand proofs anymore. They use technology to prove things. They had um, that experience with your classes, right? Oh yeah, so it was like, Christine kind of alluded to the fact that in February we were in a bit of a panic mode. We were still learning the language and still had lessons working through for the students. So there were points where we were actually behind where the students were. And uh, so, on occasion, I end up grabbing really difficult questions out of contests, math contests, and giving it to the students, not telling them where it came from, and just saying, here you go, I would like you to code up a solution for me on this. If I gave those questions to students in a math classroom, it would have been terrifying. They would have run away in, you know, absolute fear from that. Um, but in terms of, <coughs> pull out the white one, there you go. Um, in terms of with the computer science students, I would give them this problem and uh, often a half an hour later they're like, oh yeah, I'm done now. Like no fear whatsoever. So it was very, very interesting how they were able to deal with that. So it's, it's very exciting to see what this looks like as a possibility in terms of how we teach math. Of course our biggest challenge is getting the hardware itself, right? The software is a free download, so that's easy. You just need to get the hardware to, to do it. Five laptops really services five kids. We have a couple more that will bring their own laptops, but you need more than that. So that's our biggest challenge right now, is getting enough Mac OS devices, and if we end up using it in the math classroom, enough iOS devices to do that. 
we are in the middle of a one to one Chromebook implementation with this board, but it's important to expose students to multiple platforms, right? When they go off into the real world, they're not all going to be Android users, they're not all going to be Mac users. They're going to have a mix of devices. It's important that they learn to code and use devices from across those. So if we can give that exposure, I think that would be really, really powerful for our students. So that's our biggest challenge. Let's take a quick look at what the playgrounds actually look like. So let me just bring it up here. So here we have a typical playground. You can see it's a very clean interface. We have at the side here our output that's happening right away. So if I make a change, you're going to see that change happen on the left-hand side. So if I have right now, hello my friends, I know that you're really my good friends, I can <coughs> change that, and you can see that automatically it starts running. I didn't press anything, of course, because I've got to press that again. And it automatically changes to my good friends. We have a few glitches because our hardware is getting old. It's 2012 and we're now in 2016. Um, but still works very, very well. If I want to change and count instead of from 2 to 4, I want to count from 1 to 4, I just change that. And right away, you can see in the console at the bottom, it's changing that. On the side, it's telling me I'm running this loop four times. If I want to take a closer look at that, I can just hit the plus. And then over here, if I want to see more than just the last value, I can print out all of the values. So lots of interactivity. When I'm ready and I've conquered sort of some basic coding skills, then I can open up, see, notice that we are in Xcode. I can open up the power of Xcode simply by clicking on the buttons at the top. Now you can see all the files that actually create that playground. And on the right hand side, you can see we've got some menus. At the bottom here, we've got some drag and drop code. So if I'm using this in a math classroom and I want to grab some code, I don't really know the syntax for an if else or a switch, I can just drag and drop it and then put in the values that I want to use. So that's one of the things that we can do to sort of help our, our students out. Once you've graduated from that and they're ready to take a look at some graphical pieces, uh, then it's simply a case of loading up the interface builder and so on, but it's still within these same tools. Lee's going to show you some of the results of those graphical pieces. So one of the things that we've done is that uh, we have regularly okay, there we go, um, been teaching computer science in more or less the same way for years and years and years. And Swift really lends itself towards doing things in a more graphical way. So I started out initially in the first day or so just saying, okay, well, how do we get Xcode working? How do we make sure that we can make a basic app within the playground, that kind of thing? But then right after that, we wanted to get stuff onto the device. So this actually was very simple to do. I just took my iPad, I plugged it into my computer, and Xcode said, oh, you have an iPad. Would you like to have this app now go onto the iPad? Yes, I would, please. I hit OK, and boom, it's there. So this is the very first one that ended up showing up. And this happened on either day two or day three of the semester. Um, it's very exciting. Sorry. OK, anyway. Uh, but what we actually have is it does a little bit more than that, not much more. Uh, everywhere that I'm touching the screen, it is just telling me the coordinates of where I'm touching. That's all. Not a whole lot. Um, but apparently I've touched this 19 times. You can just see down there, it's actually keeping track of that for me. Um, moving on though, a couple of days later, we started to get into something a little bit more interesting. This, I actually have a label now, and it says touch and drag a point. And the main reason for this is because there's an algorithm that you teach in grade 12 computer science called the Euclidean algorithm. And it helps you determine very quickly the way that you can find the greatest common divisor between any two positive integers. I wanted to illustrate that in a visual way. And the way that we ended up doing that, I grabbed a point and I just drag across the screen and it makes a rectangle. I can make that rectangle move however I want. And it's always measuring the side, and it's telling me the greatest common divisor between those two side lengths. Um, it's, there we go. Apparently, between, oh, rats missed it. Um, but apparently, with some of these, well, with most of them, the greatest common divisor is one. But if I didn't like that rectangle and I wanted to try a different one, ah, 
when you let go, sometimes it moves around a little bit. But in any case. Um, so part of the advantage of teaching this was that I was teaching standard computer science topics in a highly visual way, which has really helped in terms of the students understanding. Uh, the next one was one that it was just kind of cool actually. I was playing around with an algorithm. This is an example of a fractal. It's called a dragon curve. And this is just something that it's not a lot of code, but it's a nice little problem for the students to play around with and it gives them a bit better of a visual understanding of what's going on in the underlying mathematics. This next one is called the Tower of Hanoi, and again, this is a very standard computer science topic, but it's hard to be able to really have a good grasp of the underlying method, and in this case, it's what's called recursion. And what we have here is, it's a little game. It's uh, not a very complicated one. I have a stack of disks on the left, and there are two middle platforms that just don't seem to be showing up properly because our projector, I guess. And what we end up having here is that I can move a disk, any disk, one at a time. And my only rule is that I can take a disk from one platform to another, one at a time. And I can never move a disk of a larger width onto a disk of smaller width. So it just bounces back. And my goal is actually to move all the disks over to a different platform. Now, admittedly, this takes a little bit of time with a disk, so I'm not going to do that now. But it's a nice little visualization again for the students. Uh, and then the last one was also to illustrate some problems in computer science. There's a data structure called the, a linked list, and then within that, it just happens to be a whole pile of different items that are joined together. So there you go, I've joined those two together, those two together. Oh, those are fine too. How about this one? Can I join that? No, I can kill that one off. Maybe that's... There we go. So I can join a whole bunch of these together. I can move them around if I need to. And let's say that I want to get rid of that particular box, then I will do that. And the list reforms itself. So these are all actually, in hindsight, very simple apps. At the time, they didn't seem like it. Christine and I worked for quite a while trying to get these to work. Um, a lot of that actually wasn't fighting with the language, but with the interface elements of Apple itself. So we were just trying to work in and around that. Uh, in the end, something like this, I believe it was around 200 lines of code. So this is again something that, it, uh, with more familiarity, it becomes much, much easier to do. Any questions? Yes, I do. Um... Have you experimented with other types of coding programs like Scratch? And I think Google has one too. And what is your comparison? What do you like or any sort of feedback? The biggest difference we found between Swift and some of the other programming language, like Scratch, for example, mm -hmm. is that it's scalable. Right? Swift is a tool that actual developers use for full time employment. Okay. Nobody very few, I would yeah. guess. Nobody uses Scratch. Yeah. <laughs> in the real world. Yeah. So, giving students a tool that is authentic is an actual tool that they're going to use and can use and can start using now. Right? There's nothing that says a student can't, in their spare time, create an app, put it on the app store, and become a millionaire. Right? They could, in theory, do that. And I think that's where, for high school students, that's important. Right? Middle school. As long as it looks cool, they're happy, right? They're not thinking about jobs yet. What do I want to be? I want to be a fireman, right? But high school kids are starting to look at that next stage in life, and they're starting to say, well, who am I, and what can I do? And they need real tools, right? They want to be adults, and this is a chance to be an adult. It's a, it's a real tool that they can start low, low floor, high low ceiling. Low floor, high ceiling. Right? It's an excellent way to do that. I, one of the things that Christine mentioned that she was at the WWDC back in June, and one of the presentations from that was the Design Awards. One of the students that won that was a 16-year-old from Mexico, and in his spare time, wherever he found that, he made this absolutely fantastic and innovative game that was on the App Store, and then got awarded for that. I mean, it was, it was just stellar. You aren't going to be able to do that with something like Scratch or Hopscotch or Logo or any one of those other tools because they just don't scale, yeah. right? You, you can play around with it for an hour, maybe two, and at that point you've exhausted all the possibilities. Whereas this, 
you can just, yeah, yeah you, you don't have that issue. Because I will be teaching coding to grade nines, and the, yes. the plan was to introduce Scratch to them, but now if this is more industry standard. Like, that's yeah. what I'd like them to get more out of. Like, that's it, what. It's definitely a challenge. Our biggest challenge on that is the so, hardware. Yes, right. Exactly. Right, so working in and around that. Um, there are other apps that, sorry, applications, not apps, that you can maybe take a peek at around that. Um, with grade nines, it's always a bit of a challenge. Just focusing on the difference between the requirements of syntax versus the requirements of, I really just want to drag and drop. And so working within things like that. So I've heard about successes with grade 10 classes using Game Maker, for instance. So okay. you know there may be issues around that that could help sort of in your in your quest. Okay. Good. <laughs> uh, no drag and dropping. The there only drag and dropping there is the Xcode, in the, the, in the Xcode. yeah in Xcode the ID at the bottom right hand corner is a it's a contextual drag and drop. Oh, so do we do button drops? Button yep. Drops? Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. There, there's an entire section of it around how you can end up making apps easier. And the problem is, Xcode as a device, there are just these multi-thousand page books just on Xcode and how to use it. It's incredibly complicated. WWDC, they put out what, like, I want to say about 100 videos every June on all the new features they've added. And each one of these videos is an hour long. And you're saying, oh, that's a lot of information. You know, <laughs> so, so you, you have, have to work with it. The power and the ability to do so many different things, and yet you can still come in and do some fantastic things that are worth putting on the app store, worth actually other people using. It's it, that scalability you just don't get.